One Saturday night, in the summer of 2010, I was hanging out with this girl named Amber. It was a summer fling during my college years. We were bored and she suggested we go to these hot spring pools out in the middle of the desert. As it was already 10 p.m., it was kind of a dumb thing to do. But, in the spirit of being young and carefree, we grabbed some beer and my pellet gun to shoot jackrabbits, way overpopulated in this area, and their eyes really shone in the headlights. We loaded into the car, drove for an hour, and then hit the dirt road. The dirt road was at least 30 miles long with no civilization, no other cars, no stores, no power lines even. We arrived at the hot springs. It was midnight as we pulled into the open dirt area right off the dirt road. I saw my first car in an hour, a white beat-down van with Cali plates. It was creepy. The shades were hanging on the windows, like there was a lantern out front and an uneven sloppy set-up table. Garbage was randomly scattered on the ground. I was kinda wishing I had a real gun at this point. Right off the bat, not even seeing a person, my signs were going off. I backed the car into the lots for unloading our camping stuff, and later unknown to be our escape. Amber and I got out of the car. He hello anyone here? I yowled, hoping the van belonged to some majorly outdoorsy college student, and not some shameless homeless man. Shh, Amber said. They're probably sleeping. No one said anything, so we walked over to the hot spring pool within 20 or 30 feet from the van. Amber and I started undressing. I was sitting on the edge of the pool with my legs dipped in, and she was taking her shirt off, right when we heard, uh, oh, hey in a creepy, whispery voice. She immediately threw her shirt back on, and I hopped out of the pool. Shining a light on the far side of it 15 feet away was a man partially peeking around a rock. Holy crap, where'd you come from? I yelled. Didn't you hear me yelling if anyone was here? He replied, I was underwater. As he came around from the other side of the rock, still only showing his head out of the water, he was a white man, a bald head, maybe in his 40s. Not the cool outdoorsy college students I'd hoped for. Trying to decide whether we wanted to stay, I engaged him in conversation. His responses were weird. He never said much. Answered at his speed even going underwater for a bit only to come up and answer minimally on his own time. He sounded kind of mean. The creepy, oh hey, was an upgrade from his speaking voice. Amber and I looked at each other thinking the same thing, and that this guy was pretty weird. In a minute or two I've known him in this conversation, his ping-pongy and informationless answers have already almost fixated fear in me. Oddly enough though, he seemed to have fixated his attention on Amber. As we gathered our things and put our clothes on, he said loudly, Leaving already? Yeah, I said. We're on a date. Where you want to go? He said even louder. I asked him, Are you alone out here? Wondering why he spoke so loudly. He said yes. Wanting to change the conversation to let Amber get all her stuff, I asked, What do you do in California? He said, I just got out of Folsom State Prison. Folsom State is just not a prison, but a prison known for violence. Amber and I looked at each other, feeling that this situation was getting worse by the second. When all of a sudden... Two men appeared from the sagebrush by his van. They came out and said hi, smiling like jackals. Both the men were skinny and normal height. They were younger, maybe in their late twenties. I looked over at the man in the pool and smiled, now realizing his lie. Wow, we, your girlfriend is really pretty, said one of the men who appeared out of nowhere. Guessing they were high on meth and probably drunk, and I said thanks, fidgeting the pellet gun around. The man crawled out of the pool, walked over to the van and motioned for them to talk to him. As they did that, Amber and I got to walk into our car. The skinny one, who made the comment about Amber's appearance, jogged over to us and said, Hey, let me show you a pool you could take your girlfriend to. It's right on the other side of the road you don't even have to get in your car. He had positioned himself in front of the driver's side door, really pushy. She can wait here to make sure it's okay with you. The other men were watching intently, so if I pushed him out of the way, it might have kicked off a battle. 
Sure, Amber, let's go. I was going to be damned if they separated us. We walked across a road into the darkness. He asked us while walking, What kind of gun is that? Not knowing if he saw the small diameter to barrel, replied, 22. Not really powerful, but doesn't matter when you only do headshots. This response was overly confident, but I was pleased he realized what I was saying. On the edge of the road, he started to lead us into a huge thicket of sagebrush. Now was my chance. I grabbed Amber's hand and we quietly walked back to the car swiftly, and the men saw us approach our car, stopped their conversation and faced us. Almost forgot the beer, I said chirpily as we hopped in then, quickly, and equally as quickly, drove as far away as we could. There was no other pool we were going to be led to, just sagebrush. So, I knew we were being led to something bad. Luckily, my intuition kicked in and we got out of there. I live in Georgia, in a small town dubbed the Town of No Hope. We call it this because there is nothing really to do except to go to church, go to work, go to Walmart and repeat. A little background for my story. This story takes place when I was 10 or so years old in a house that has no prior paranormal activity. I am 18 years old now, and this story still freaks me out. I do not want to give away my real name, so I just call myself Alice. I was in my room, taking a nap when I had a weird dream. In it, I saw a young teen girl in my room. I asked her, who are you? And she smiled and walked out of my room. Before she did though, she said, I'll see you in a few years, Alice. I woke up and thought it was a strange dream, but paid no heed to it. Later that week, my dad is talking to my mom and he says, Hey honey, I had a weird dream last night. My mom answers asking what happened, and he replies, I dreamed there was a young girl in our bedroom, looking at us, and she just left. She didn't say anything at all. I instantly felt cold all over. Even though I was only 10 I knew my parents might not believe me, so I decided to keep my mouth shut. Fast forward to 4 or so years later, I am now in my room listening to Depeche Mode when I hear my mom call me. I call back, one sec mom. I'll go there my mom asks why I left my phone on the table. Confused I said oh sorry mom I must have left it there I guess. She says okay and said to be more careful with my things. That night, my dad said over dinner. Honey, I had a weird dream today. She replies, Oh really? What happened? He said, Well, I was on the couch and I was watching TV. I looked and saw Alice in a white gown, put her phone on the table and leave. My mom and I never told my dad about my phone. I shrug it off as a weird coincidence and go back to eating because maybe my mom mentioned something to my dad. A few days later my mom asks, Alice, I lost my earring, can you help me search for it? I said sure mom, and short helping her look for it. After about an hour we give up and go downstairs to make dinner. That night, my mom found her earring on the bedside table. We had definitely searched there, and we did not see it somehow. What was really weird, was that next to her earring was a black gem. I do not know what kind it was, to be honest. Okay. At this point we're both really freaked out and saying what the heck. My parents brush it off, but I did not. The next day while we were driving, I threw a rock out the window and it fell in our county's lake. I figured that would be it, and how very wrong I was. A few weeks pass and nothing special happens until one day, my dad comes into my room. Alice, have you seen my wallet? I frowned. No dad, I haven't. Have you asked Paul about it? He frowned and said yes I have. If he find it please let me know. And I of course told him I would. A day later he found it in my parents' bed. Again, there was that damn rock next to it. That's it, I told them. We are burning white sage in this house. They agreed and we have had nothing weird happen since. There's still lots of questions that remain unanswered though. Were the dreams in the rock connected? How would the same rock travel for that length then? Most of all, who was that weird girl? Is she connected? This happened when my dad was 16, 
all the way back in 1976. Him and my uncle Nigel were very outgoing and liked to explore to keep themselves occupied. When the summer of 76 came around, my dad finished school. He wanted to do one big bit of adventuring before he began work. The Pennine Way For those who do not know, the Pennine Way is a 270-mile walkway in Britain that, depending on which way you walk, starts in just south of Scotland and basically cuts through the middle of England and finishes in the Midlands. It usually takes around a three to four week walk. With a long summer to fill, my dad and 15-year-old Uncle Nigel and my dad's friend Russ were dropped off in Scotland by my great-grandfather to begin their hike. The first week went swimmingly. They met some nice locals who even cooked them food and gave them room to sleep in and generally enjoyed this whole new level of freedom entrusted upon them. They mainly camped in clear areas, but one day, they decided to cover an extra five miles in order to reach a village as they needed to buy some more food and get spare tents. They stumbled into a village around 6 p.m. and saw the local pub was opening. After relaxing in the pub with some drinks, my dad tells me that the owner probably knew they were in her age but wanted all the business they could get. The owner offered to let the guys camp out in the back field of their pub. The landlady says wife said the owner seemed oddly hesitant at first, looking a bit concerned and having a bit of a word with her husband in private. However, Yorkshire hospitality seemed to override any doubt she had after a night of heavy drinking with the locals. They resided to their tent. My dad says they were using an oil lantern hooked to a center of the tent as a light source, and when they turned it off, they left it hanging which is important, not only for what happened next, but also what happened the next day. My dad woke up and turned off the oil light while debating to get up and having a piss in the field, seeming as the owners had been nice in letting them camp out there, when he heard a door creak open from the creek shuts. There were no footsteps, so my dad had to put it down to an old shed or something. After a few seconds, however, the sound of feet landing on grass became progressively audible until they stopped right outside the tent. My dad thought it was the owner checking in on us, and he went to unzip the tent. The owner fully unzipped it. My dad said the weird thing about this was that he didn't have a shirt on, just some slippers and night trousers. After my dad asked what was doing, he stuttered out some excuse about hearing a growl and went to check if the boys were okay and safe. There was no growl as the only sound in the last five minutes was the door, the footsteps, and the unzipping of the tent. The guy weirdly emphasized the need for a good sleep before hiking and intrusively tapped on the oil light, asking for it to be turned off. He walked off, letting off a frustrated sigh and nearing the house and closed the door behind him. Morning comes and the owner's wife makes the boys some breakfast while they pack up their stuff. The owner takes down the tent for them and takes off somewhere in his 4x4 without coming back to the house. They thank the woman and tell her husband, thank you as well. She says that, when she figures out when he comes back, that he will tell him. They come to their designated camping spot, just next to a small stream, around an hour and a half early and decide to have a longer rest after walking around 130 to 140 miles over the past 8 to 9 days. They pull out the tent and find lots of small holes, all about a pen's width and wide. What's weird about this is my dad described the size of it as holding a pen while telling me this. Everyone looks confused, and my dad rationalizes this by the man telling him about an animal last night. It must have come back and nibbled on the tent, as that, that explains it, sure. Russ suggests they walk back to a different village around two miles back and try to get another tent. They leave the now useless tent as a marker for their size and walk back to the village. Their luck, a shop clearly targeting walkers is open. Unfortunately, they didn't have any tents, but they decide to buy tape and cover the holes for tonight and hope to find a new tent somewhere soon. When walking back, the sun had begun to set and it was quite dark, moonlight mainly guiding them back down the path. When they returned to their sights, they couldn't believe it. Their tent was set up for them, but it was on fire, completely engulfed in flames. They threw the water in their bottles over the tent and used the stream water to fill them and eventually douse the fire. When they looked inside the tents, their oil lamp at glass had been smashed and someone had followed them, set up their tent and waited for them to return before smashing the oil lamp hand 
in turn, lighting up the tent in flames. My dad told me that there really is an explanation except for the pub owner. He was stopping doing whatever he was planning on doing with my dad being away and decided to take some fucked up form of revenge by sending a message. At first, I totally didn't believe my dad and thought he was trying to scare me. But upon referencing the burning tent incident in a phone to my uncle Nigel, he instantly started rambling about how weird it was. My uncle Nigel does not lie. When I was 13, and 32 now, my parents, my brother and I moved to a 100-year-old school house. I mean, it was so old it didn't have indoor plumbing of any kind, but we made do. We were used to living rough in eastern Kentucky anyway. Our closest neighbor was the better part of a mile away. Well, it started with the huge windows. Back before electricity was a thing, they made the windows as tall as they could in the schoolhouses to let the light in as much as possible. Well, I was in the kitchen in a large Rubbermaid tub we bathed in. It definitely got the job done. It was nighttime, and I saw what I thought was a big black shadowy person sitting on the hill watching me. When he saw me, he seemed to have run off. My parents thought this was a kid from next door, but this was late at night and he was kept in a short lease by his grandparents and he did not fit what I saw on the lease. But every so often at night, you'd see flashes of someone on the hill crouched down looking in. My mom finally put thick curtains up because it spooked us so much. One night, my parents were arguing. It was around 3 a.m. and my mom was being awful to my dad as she normally was. I was asleep, but was awakened by a sharp, loud knock at her front door. My dad got up and, bewildered, opened it to no one there. Apparently, it was tired of hearing my mom, too. We were all scared my mom walked me to my bus the next morning because I was terrified my brother stayed home. While we waited, way off at the distance we hear the largest, loudest all I can describe is yell, but it lasted for 30 seconds or more. It knew we were there. It was watching us all the time. As time went on, in the summer, it gets braver and braver, and it seems to get more friendly. My legal cousin, who was legally blind, came to visit us. He could not see well, but especially without his glasses. He was in my mom's room playing the Super Nintendo, and said, Hey, there was a big man with a beard and long hair looking in the window. He said he figured it was someone we knew, and he didn't have his glasses, so when he asked why he didn't tell us if there was someone there, we never talked about our friends or fear of scaring him. Well, the only thing is the window was seven or eight feet off the ground. That man would have either have had to been taller than anyone I've ever met or on a ladder. Another night, my parents had left for the night and my boyfriend and I were there alone. Something was running around knocking on the outside of her house all night. That was only the second time I'd been scared by them. Let me tell you the first and the worst. My dad and brother started sitting on our stone steps at night trying to have an encounter, and they did. One night, it finally happened. The smaller of the two we saw regularly in our window shimmied up our hillside into our yard. The scary part is, it crawled on its belly like an army man. I don't know why that unnerved me so bad, but he got almost within touching distance as my mom and I watched through the window. This was in like 1998 before camera phones and all that, but it was scary, but maybe not so threatening. We came to the conclusion that we were looking at some creepy mom or son kind of creature thing, we, we don't know. But we moved, we've never heard anything more about it. I've never told anyone this because of fear of ridicule, but there's no reason for me to lie. Unknowingly to the naked eye, I'm a private law enforcement officer in which I enforce state laws underneath independent contact. Unlike public or urban officers who are tax paid and work underneath the government, 
Think of me as being similar to a personal attorney instead of an appointed attorney, if you were to ever get in a sticky situation. My unnerving doubts about my obscure occupation started four years after I regrettably accepted a seemingly simple contact from a middle-aged eastern male stockbroker who merely requested a private escort across the state in an unmarked vehicle. On the phone, the low-tone man oddly asked only two uncomfortable and uncommon questions or requests, which were, may we not take any back roads? and may we not make any stops whatsoever, please and thank you. After he hung up without saying goodbye, I knew right then that this was not going to be some sort of contact for a novice officer such as myself. But after reviewing the massive payout, $7,000, I would have been a complete fool to at least not meet this shady guy. And to note, I'm no fool. At least, I thought so at the time. A couple weeks later, two hours before midnight, I alone meet the nerve-shocked guy at an airport approximately 225 miles from his desired destination, which I was unfamiliar with. He did not greet me, nor did he see anything beyond this, remember our agreement, no back roads and no stops, please and thank you. What type was wrong with this guy? Either way, I allowed this weird dude into my unmarked car and we headed off. After about an hour or so, and after turning into our exit ramp, I looked into my side mirrors and saw two black and tinted vans ease into my blind spots on my opposite sides. This didn't draw a red flag until I glanced into my rearview mirror and saw the guy, with deep red eyes oddly leaning downwards in his seat, as if he didn't want to be seen by people in the black vans. After about five minutes or so, the black tinted vans kept in pace with us. The guy's phone rang, and shortly after he answered it, he sharply said no. My red flag was up straight up, but not waving just yet, if you catch my drift. But that was short-lived because six to seven minutes later, the guy's phone rung again, yet he refused to answer. And after that moment, the crap began to hit the fan. The van on my left side aggressively sped up until it was ahead of me, and afterward it recklessly cut into my lane before slowing down. This freaked me out so much that I didn't have the chance to notice that the van on my right side had lightly rammed itself into my driver's side, which forced me into the next foremost lane. All the while, the guy's phone's persistently ringing, as if it was possessed. My red flag was waving, like a little punk now. Instead of being forced into the next exit, I slammed on my brakes, with the mindset of escaping the pinning grip of the vans. However, the van on our right side managed to ram the control of the front wheels from me, which sent our vehicle into a tense but controllable spin. I managed to regain controls of Yokel before speeding off into the opposite way of the pursuing vans. As our car sped down the empty highway, I eagerly yelled at the guy, freaking dial 911, but he just sat there in utter shock looking at his possessed phone. So I called 911 and they said to stay in the phone as they dispatched state troopers to our area. However, before I knew it, one of the vans attempted to rear-end our car before the van side-ended us, which was enough to send us off the road into the quickly approaching deep woods, and therefore forcing me to a sudden stop. The van surrounded and blocked us in, without a way of escape that didn't involve fleeing into the dark thick woods. Before the van doors opened, I eerily felt an agonizing pop in my ear, the guy in the back seat had shot the rear view window before climbing out and fleeing into the devouring woods. More than a small gang of men were hot pursuit of the man. As for me, I was dragged out of the car, punched firmly in my side gut, and then ordered to drive away or get beaten. At first, I chose the latter, but after a few more manic gangsters got involved, I wisely chose the smart option. Terrified, I fled along the highway and so I met the troopers before heading to the hospital. I told them my entire story and they investigated. A couple of arrests were made, but none of the men arrested were nationals, so they could not be charged with first-degree murder.